what awaits us on Mars. While our knowledge of Mars has advanced greatly over the decades since we first began to explore the planet with probes, there is still a lot that we don't know, such as if it once had life, or whether it still does. While we see tantalizing hints, such as seasonal rises in methane levels, no dead ringer for the existence of Martian microbes has yet surfaced. My guest suggested in a paper in the year 2000 that maybe we should look for the biggest biosignature of them all on Mars. Deposits of petroleum possibly put there by microbial life. Set a course for Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Dr. John McGowan. Dr. McGowan has a PhD in physics from the University of Illinois and has worked as a contractor at NASA Ames Research Center involved in the research and development of image and video processing algorithms and technology. He worked as a human interface device algorithm engineer with Apple, most notably where he researched and developed signal processing algorithms for the Apple Pencil. Welcome everyone to Event Horizon with me, John Michael Godier. If you enjoy what you hear, fall into the Event Horizon, hit the like button, and become an active subscriber by ringing the bell. Dr. McGowan, welcome to the program. Glad to be here. Now, Doctor, back in the year 2000, you authored a paper that the premise is, if Mars had life, ancient life, and had it for a long enough time, it might have deposited basically oil fields on Mars. Now, this idea fascinates me of oil fields on Mars because you, I can imagine that petroleum, if, if life is rare in the universe, petroleum is extremely rare. <laughs> Probably one of the rarest some substances there is if, if life is rare. So what led you to this idea of petroleum on Mars? Well, it's a roundabout story. When I was at NASA Ames Research Center, I was involved in kind of a feasibility study for an airplane that would fly on Mars. And so we were, I was primarily concerned with taking video, but I got into thinking about what could you use an airplane for? Uh, for example, looking for life, how we could you find life? And that led me to think about these questions. Um, I've always had an interest in the theory that oil and natural gas is not from fossils, but actually is primordial material from the formation of the planet. So that's actually what got me thinking about this question. Uh, if the, the sort of unorthodox theory that oil and natural gas comes from the formation of the planet when it condenses from the planetary nebula, then you actually would expect the moon, Mars, asteroids, many bodies in the solar system to have um, oil and natural gas in them. And of course, particularly uh, methane, natural gas, is going to seep to the surface and Mars has an atmosphere. So the idea was, okay, let's look for that. And I thought about it some more, and I said, well, you know, the current thinking is that there was an ocean on Mars in its very early days, and there may have been life on Mars, you know, billions of years ago. And so if the mainstream theory is correct, you actually also would anticipate that there very possibly could be oil and natural gas formed from, you know, bacteria is the current theory, formed from bacteria that got trapped in sedimentary rocks and somehow pressure cooked into oil and natural gas as we think happens on earth now on earth the you know our fossil fuels are a major indicator of life right mm -hmm. that's the usual thinking yes so now on mars how would you detect that i mean could you do it from orbit rather than in a plane or something like that i mean because we have seepage from um our deposits here on earth we see evidence of it as i, as I recall you mentioned uh California, a major one there. Yes. C could, could we tell from orbit um, if, if Mars has petroleum? Well, they've made some attempts to do that. There's an orbiting sensor now, which is supposed to look for methane. And I believe that it hasn't been able to find it, but I may not have followed. As, as you probably know, these methane detections in the Martian atmosphere kind of come and go. They're intermittent. So the problem is that if you have this seepage going on, it's probably at a pretty low level. So they're talking right now about 
maybe tens of parts per billion of the Martian atmosphere. So although there, you might be able to put a sensor in orbit, it may just not be sensitive enough with current technology to see it. On the other hand, something like a plane can get much closer. In fact, it could fly a few hundred meters, a few hundred yards above the surface of Mars. And the concentration of methane at that altitude is going to be a lot higher, and therefore sort of proximity sensors uh, can actually tell that there's methane in the atmosphere. Is there any way to differentiate biological methane versus geological methane? I think there's been some attempts to look at things like how much of the carbon in the methane is carbon-13, for example. I'm rather skeptical. I think what we will do is find where the methane comes from and see what's producing it, and that's the only way to be sure whether it's really biological or from some other cause. Uh, you usually find that people can come up with some scenario to explain some biomarker that's supposedly unique to life, you know, this chemical or that. And so I suspect the reality is, even with things like isotopes and some of these other ideas, no one is really going to be satisfied until you actually find what's producing the methane. So how do you do that? I mean, can you use ground penetrating radar? Well, I looked at ground penetrating radar and it can probably detect that there's something under the ground that's different, but it can't really tell if you're looking at something like methane or not. So that's one of the advantages of using an aircraft of some kind, whether it's an airplane or a, a, like a dirigible, a balloon with a motor on it or something like that, is you could actually trace back to the source of the seeping methane. So it's likely to be coming up at a specific location as it does on Earth and then land there. And if you're lucky, you can actually see what's going on at the surface. If not, you're going to have to probably drill down in some way to find where it's coming from and what's actually happening. You know, the, the, these deposits on Earth are also abodes of life. So could Mars's life have survived within these oil fields? Well, based on the experience on Earth, yeah, it's actually quite possible. Uh, now, a lot of the oil fields on Earth, I think, are thought to be a few hundred million years old, as opposed to, you know, several billion, whereas the ones on Mars, there's a good chance they might be billions of years old. So we don't know for sure how long something's going to survive. But petroleum oil is basically fuel. It's basically food. So certain organisms can eat it. So if the oil field survives, it's very possible that organisms will survive in the oil field and even might come up to the surface if the oil is kind of seeping up to the surface. And therefore, you might actually be able to tell without drilling all the way down. You know, it might be miles beneath the surface. And you might not want to drill down because if you want to isolate that life and study it, you want to be very careful on what you do. Yes. Is there any way we have all these plans, SpaceX, of going to Mars privately? Is What could we do with these hydrocarbons if they're there? I mean, could we actually use those because they're obviously very useful on Earth. Um, could we use those in, in the exploration of uh, Mars? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can make plastics. You can make a lot of things from petroleum, from oil. Uh, it's an energy source. Um, there isn't much oxygen in the atmosphere on Mars, but there's supposedly you know, oxides on the surface, peroxide and other things in the soil and dust. So in theory, you could actually essentially burn it or combust it and so produce energy from it as well as making various chemicals. I mean, it would be an enormous you know, resource that we don't have to transport to Mars. If we found it, it would make it much easier. If we could find you know, bulk quantities of it that were exploitable, that would make the process of both exploring and maybe even eventually settling Mars easier. So say we, you know, like, like with <laughs> anthropogenic climate change on Earth, as far as Mars climate change, we could actually use, use these deposits to help warm up the planet with more carbon dioxide. Possibly, yeah. I haven't given that a lot of thought, but Definitely. Uh, I mean, in theory, if you oxidize, you can get carbon dioxide and you can get water. So people want water and you could pump more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And then, yes, it probably would heat up the planet and make it more livable. About abiotic oil, which is an intriguing concept. I, I, I know that here, at least in the Western world, it's not really given a whole lot of credibility. But I know that like the Russians do give it credibility. Could you give us an overview of abiotic oil? Yes, the, the basic idea is pretty simple. We know, for, I think, almost for a fact or very likely that the original planetary nebulas actually were methane and water and some other stuff. And so the explanation for why methane isn't and therefore maybe oil isn't trapped in the Earth, according to the mainstream theory, is that supposedly the Earth got extremely hot when it formed and this caused combustion of methane and oxides or whatever produced carbon dioxide and water and therefore the earth basically the methane and other stuff came from this biological process that we theorize occurred but going way back um, people have have speculated that in fact 
you know, the oil and natural gas came from this original formation of the planetary nebula. The methane got trapped in the planet and it underwent some sort of polymerization process to produce, you know, oil and, and more complicated hydrocarbons. And that theory is, I don't think it's ever had much following sort of in the West. Um, it's associated in the West with Thomas Gold, who's a very famous uh, physicist and uh, planetary scientist at Cornell. He passed away, I don't know, I think about 2004 or something like that. And he was very involved in this theory and promoting this theory that it was actually primordial material. But it has a long history in the Ukraine, in Russia, where it's been taken much more seriously. And at least what I've read, anyway, is that there's quite a number of oil and uh, natural gas fields in the former Soviet Union that, that are in non-sedimentary rock. They just went and drilled, you know, right through a lava, uh, into lava type rock or metamorphic rock, and they found substantial amounts of oil and natural gas. So again, there are examples of oil fields with significant amounts of oil or natural gas that in fact are in rocks that the that biological theory doesn't seem to explain. Oil where it shouldn't be. Now, this could have huge implications because it may be that we've missed large amounts of oil in North America that that, <laughs> that that we just didn't think to look for. Is that right? That could be. I I haven't made a in depth review of exactly where you know we have and haven't looked for oil in North America or Canada or whatever. So I don't know how much exploration has been done of kind of the rocks that are non sedimentary that you would not expect to see things like coal or natural gas or oil to be in. Primordial hydrocarbons. We have one big glaring example of this in the outer solar system, which is Titan. Titan is loaded with hydrocarbons. In fact, they're the only other liquid in the solar system other than water that, you know, we see present. How does that play in? Is, is that one, is, are they preserved there in the conventional theory simply because it's too far from the sun or too small or whatever for the combustion to not happen? That's a little bit out of my, uh, what I know for sure. I think probably they would say that either Titan is relatively small, so it didn't heat up enough, or possibly there was a somewhat different condensation formed the main rocky Titan, and then somehow these you know hydrocarbons then rain down on the surface or something like that would probably be the explanation for it in the conventional theory. Right. Could it be that Mars has abiotic oil, but Earth doesn't, and that both models are in some way correct, and that Earth's oil is you know formed through uh, microorganisms, but Mars may have actually abiotic oil. I mean, is there a dividing line where this can happen in a certain conditions? I guess what I'm saying is, is there two ways to form oil? That could be. I mean, in both theories, there's sort of these big unknowns. So in the conventional mainstream biological theory, the actual specific process, the chemistry, the physics that turns the bacteria into oil and natural gas is not understood. As far as I know, it still can't be reproduced in the laboratory. And similarly, in the abiotic theory, the primordial theory, this polymerization process by which the original methane somehow got turned into, you know, gasoline, turned into these complex hydrocarbons, is also not really understood. It's, it's, it's a gap. I mean, they're saying somehow this happened. But again, I don't think they can prove how it happened. So that naturally means that, in fact, we could be seeing both processes. There could be chemistry possible that produces both situations. And I, I suspect we don't know enough at this point to answer that question. Now, one thing I found particularly intriguing about this was that we see kerogen, which is thought to be a precursor to oil thought. I stress that word. Mm -hmm. We find that very, very early in the fossil record on Earth, mm -hmm. as I recall, like 3.8 billion years. Is that a strong indicator that there might be a problem with the standard model of how we view oil formation? I don't know that it's strong because again, we don't understand what happens. So you could easily envision that simple bacteria formed very soon after the earth cooled off. You know, and you're usually talking about rocks in Australia that we think are like several billion years old. And some of them got caught in sediments and whatever this mysterious process is that creates oil and natural gas or kerogen or whatever happened very, very early on. And it's not a you know new thing. Um, so I, I don't think it, I don't know that it really says the conventional theory is wrong or right. I, I doubt we know enough about the actual process to answer that question. It's interesting that we know so little, you know, about oil, especially since we obviously use it <laughs> very extensively. Now, back to Mars. The methane releases that are observed on Mars, 
They seem to be seasonal, which is interesting to say the least. How does this, geologically speaking, how could an oil field produce a seasonal effect? Or could we even tell, you know, do we really even know enough to say that oil fields are seasonal? Do they do this on Earth? I guess I would say that's a little bit puzzling. I don't, did not find, I didn't actually look at this question of whether the seepage is seasonal. You know, there are some oil fields where, well, actually, I think there's quite a number where you get methane seepage as part of the process. And I didn't look at the data to see if there's any kind of seasonal effect in terms of like maybe you get more methane during the summer than not. So I think, again, it's it's not clear what, what it means that it's seasonal. I guess my gut reaction would be is it's a little bit of an argument maybe against an oil field. I'm not, it's not clear to me why it would tend to happen more in the summer, but I haven't thought it through completely. So it could be, you know, there's lots of possibilities. Now, current life on Mars, do you think it's there? I don't know. Okay. I have a bias that yes, it's there because I have a bias that the primordial theory of the origin of oil is correct. And part of that theory, I mean, it doesn't have to be part of that theory. Life could have been produced somewhere else than the oil fields. But if you had this primordial goop buried underground, it's a very good candidate for the kind of environment where life could have evolved. And that in the abiotic theory, the reason that there's life in the oil fields is because that's actually where life started and then it worked its way up to the surface. So if that theory, which is not the orthodox mainstream theory, is correct, then it's a there's a fairly high chance that Mars not only has oil and natural gas under underground, but actually there's life underground and it's just very inhospitable on the surface, so very little of it comes up to the surface. You know, there's another theory that Mars could be like a corpse planet where the life lives several meters underground until, you know, changes in in Mars's orientation or its orbit actually allows it every so often to sort of recolonize the surface, you know, and it, it just changes the... Mm-hmm. So it's sort of like this corpse a zombie planet where life just keeps coming back. <laughs> could be. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's fascinating because Mar- one thing Mars does is hint. And we have everything from the Allen Hills meteorite and several others and all these these sort of indicators that maybe, you know, or complex organics have been found by Curiosity that that actually look like, as I recall, the uh, the breakdown of keratin. So the chemicals that, that result look like that. So it's just it's it's almost as if Mars hints that it has or at least had life. Which is very important, obviously, because that, that if it's an independent genesis of life in the solar system, that's pretty impressive, even if microbial. All right, Doctor, I think that's about it. Thanks for joining us today. All right, all right. Glad to talk to you. As we colonize and explore the resources of Mars, one thing is for certain. There will be surprises. Mars is a planet like Earth and will likely yield unexpected things. As we mix Mars with the creativity of people, surprising things will come of it. How about a ring made of Martian gold and diamonds, statues made from Martian basalt rock, paintings made on Mars, and even culinary dishes originating from Martian kitchens, and no doubt many other things will come of a Mars colony. I think it's going to be exciting. John, with all this talk about Mars... Yes? Have you given any thought to the both of us relocating? To where exactly? Mars, John. Cydonia specifically. We're not going to Mars, Anna. Why not? I have a keen interest in launching my new biological rover experiment. Your what? I find the idea of remotely operating you to be amusing. You could pick up rocks and such. That's not going to happen, Anna. Next week, we celebrate the Apollo anniversary in the only way we can, with a surprise. See you then.